Amen. The rest of us, let's open our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 24. 2 Kings chapter 24. And we will be finishing the book of 2 Kings tonight. Second Kings chapter 24, and let's go ahead and pray as we're coming into the Word of God ourselves tonight. Lord, we bring ourselves once again to your throne of grace, Lord, as we come to study your Word. Lord, would you soften our hearts? As we are told in the New Testament, Lord, we know that these things were written for our examples, Lord, to learn from, to know, to, to grow in our knowledge of you, Lord, in, in, in our knowledge even of ourselves and what is righteousness, what is sin, Lord. And, and we pray that you'd help us to learn tonight afresh and anew. And, and just may our hearts be, have good soil, Lord, just refreshed by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week, or last time, if you remember, we'd studied in uh, chapters 22 and 23, how Judah, the southern portion of Israel, um, as it had been divided, along with Jerusalem, is now basically under the control of Egypt. And, you know, it's ironic in a way how it came full circle. You know, they had escaped, escaped from Egypt, you know, many, many years before with the help of the Lord. And now because of their continued rebellion against the Lord, they are now under the control, once again, of Egypt. Even though they didn't go back into the land, you know, they're in control of it once again. Josiah had been killed, and his son, Elikim, or Elikim, excuse me, was now ruler. And Pharaoh uh, Nero had put him in command over, uh, you know, Judah there. And as their rebellion um, continued... Now, it's interesting, you know, that Nico had changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim, meaning God has established. You know, it seemed that even though Judah had no longer had faith in the Lord, it seemed as though Egypt did. As we talked about last time in Second Chronicles, it talked about how, you know, there was war going on, and even the king of Egypt said, hey, just leave us alone. The Lord is bringing us up here. And it seemed at least he was seeking you know, some kind of blessing from the Lord. And, and it's interesting, the last thing and sad thing we read back in, in chapter 23 of 2 Kings, you can just glance at back, back at verse 37 there. It says, And he, Jehoiakim, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And so we come to chapter 24, verse 1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Now, even though Judah was under the control of Egypt, it was obviously not under the protection of Egypt. We're going to see a little bit later that Egypt, you know, tries to come and, and do something, but, you know, Babylon is, you know, too powerful. Nebuchadnezzar and his armies are just too powerful. But now Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has come and he's taken over. And, you know, and, and so as he's taken over, uh, you know, Jehoiakim became his servant now for three years. And now he rebels against him. You know, it's interesting. It was when Nebuchadnezzar came up this time, this first time, that when he went back to his own land, he took with him Israeli captives, a number of whom you may have heard of, Daniel and others and so we're very familiar with this and, and so just to kind of put this in the historical context that's what's going on but notice after three years he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in verse 2 it said and the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the Ammonites and bands of the termites and oh wait a second sorry that wasn't there was it and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. You know, so here was little Judah, if you will, 
standing up against big old mean Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, and they probably thought, hey, you know, after three years we rebelled and we're doing well. And yet you see the Lord was chastising them. The Lord was punishing them for their rebellion against him. And, and so we see in verse 2 that the Lord actually sends against him the Chaldeans and Syrians and Moabites and Ammonites to destroy them. According, notice at the end there it says, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. You know, it reminds me of what we just studied on Sunday morning. Remember where it said in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21, above all you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. And so even now, as we see at the end of verse 2 here, according to the word of the Lord, God's word will always be fulfilled. Always be fulfilled. And we need to understand that. And I think that as a Christian, man, it brings so much security into our lives that we can trust the word of God above all else because God keeps his word. And even, for the, you know, even as the Bible tells us that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and he loves the people of Israel. He chose the people of Israel, and now he's disciplining them for their rebellion. Look at verse 3. Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done. Now, if you remember back in chapter 21, we studied, we looked at what Manasseh had done in all of his wickedness against the Lord. And, and the, the, probably the saddest part about that is the people went so willingly right along with him. And we saw more clearly, even during the reign of Josiah, as we looked last time, and that, you know, even more clearly how the wickedness, how deep and pervasive it had gone. You know, when we look at our country today, and we see, you know, just how wicked... You know, the certain people are even within our country, within our politics, and, and sadly, even many within the church. And it's, it's, it's so pervasive as it continues to go, to, to just to spread out and to spread out as this wickedness continues to go. Look at verse 4. I mean, again, it's crazy. And, and also for the innocent blood that he had shed. Remember we talked about Molech. And how Molech was a false god that they had you know, offered their children to. Molech basically, we're told, they, they, they created this big you know, bronze statue that was, who knows, 20, 30 feet high. And they basically had it was empty on the inside and, and with hands out holding like this. And they basically would light the fire inside and get it just, just piping hot. And then they would place their babies on, in the hands to be killed. And asking Molech you know, the false God for this blessing or that blessing is we give you our children. Because notice in verse 4 it goes on, it says, For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon. You might want to underline, if not the whole verse, at least that last part. You know, he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, talking about the blood of the children. You know, it's interesting that the Lord's punishment is for, you know, for the people's shedding of innocent blood, you know, is, is his favor. They lose his favor. They, they are punished. And, you know, it, it's interesting that, you know, the Lord is, notice it says the Lord is punishing them back in verse 3, back in verse 2. But, man, you see that in public today. Say, you know, I, you know you go up into any public forum, go out into Portland, go into the parks in Vancouver and say, hey, you know what, the Lord is going to punish our country, our world, for the innocent blood it has spilled. And, and you're going to get crucified, basically, verbally, maybe attacked. It's crazy, even by many who profess Christ. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a really sad culture, even, again, with many with that profess the Lord, you know, that we, we don't see, we don't understand that God will not allow any country, I believe, because of what we're reading even here, that it sheds the blood of innocent children to go unjudged. You know, according to the end of verse 4, I don't think he would. Look at, for again, he, for he filled, you know, Jerusalem with the innocent blood and the Lord would not pardon. 
You know, the estimates of here in the United States, you know, since Roe v. Wade, that there's been roughly 60 million abortions. Some say slightly below that, some say slightly above that. 60 million abortions in almost 50 years. So again, that's over one, one, about 1.2 1 million abortions a year. Now, according to Light, Sife, Light um, Site News, there have been roughly, in the last 40 years, there's been 1.72 billion abortions around the world. Get, listen to that number, 1.72 billion abortions. That's a one and a seven and a two with seven zeros after it. 1.72 billion, 1 billion 720 million abortions just in the last 40 years. And many, and many say that, that there will be no wrath of God being poured out upon mankind. Why would God do that? And, and to be honest, you have to look at those people and say, what's wrong with you? With the world, you know, having shed the innocent blood of at least 1.72 billion babies. Why wouldn't the wrath of God come upon the, the whole world? And again, we know that the wrath of God is coming. And as we've talked about before, man, there's only two choices, guys and gals. We can face the wrath of God on our own, or we can allow Jesus Christ to take the wrath for us. Because all of us, before we come to Christ, stand under the wrath of God in condemnation for our love of sin. And our penalty of sin is death. And yet Christ gloriously came. He gloriously took the wrath of God upon the cross. He made a way for us to repent, to turn away from the darkness and turn to him and find forgiveness, to find new life in Jesus Christ. And, and I love that we can come to the Lord and find forgiveness and, and even in the midst of this. Now look at verse 5. We see, now the rest of the deeds of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Now in 2 Chronicles 36, we see that Jehoiakim had also been taken prisoner to Babylon. They are taken to Babylon, but then he ended up back in Jerusalem where he died. And so verse 6, so Jehoiakim slept with his fathers and Jehoiachin. So we have Kim and now Chin because he kind of looked a lot like Jay Leno. He had, had a big chin. No. His son reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come again out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. So here we see, you know, the king of Egypt, man, they're not coming out. It, it, it's done. Babylon is now the, now the big kids on, on the block. And, and Egypt offers no help to God's people. You know, it's interesting. You know, they had turned away from God, and then they went to the world. They went back to the world, and yet Egypt, the world, offers no solace, offers no protection. You know, it's an interesting thing because Egypt, when you look, you know, biblically, it always represents the world, how we come out of the world, we're saved as, you know, as, as they cross through, uh, you know, the Red Sea and we're baptized into Christ and all these representations, these pictures that we see throughout the scriptures. And so it's an interesting analogy that as they go back, as Egypt has now had been ruling over them, there's still no safety there. And, and, and we, we see the application is so clear. It's like, look, so many have claimed to come to Christ, and yet later they rebel against Christ. And they seek to go back to the world to return to Egypt and find solace, find comfort, and find strength. And yet guess what? The world has no solace, no peace, no strength to offer. And, you know, it's interesting. Peter describes this kind of, you know, acting that or actions that we do like a dog returning to its vomit. You know, and we need to be careful, you know, that, that, that if we've tasted the goodness of the Lord, you know, that, that we would come and, and enter fully in. That we wouldn't just kind of sit on that fence and, well, yeah, you know, I want to do as much as I can in the world and yet still be going to heaven, man. May we be so earthly-minded, or excuse me, so heavenly-minded 
that we are, you know, I'll be honest, I've heard people say they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I'll be honest, I've never met one person like that. Because to be honest, I think if you are truly heavenly minded, you're going to be very earthly good. Because you're going to be out, you know, telling people about the kingdom of God, telling people about sin and salvation in Christ, and we're going to be out there just sharing the gospel of the Lord. I just love that. But again, take the warning, you know, as they turned, even Egypt let them down here. Look at verse 8. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name uh, was Nehushta, and the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. So once again we see, and I think I've told you a few times before, that when I go through First and Second Kings, even when we go through Judges, you know, I, I go through and it's like, you know, I, I highlight these kind of things. You know, he did what was evil, he did what was right. Because it always warns me, it's like, you know what, Lord? And because notice it says, according to all that his father had done. And again, what a great reminder that, you know, we may have very godly mothers and fathers, and we can be very thankful for that. Biblical moms and dads, we can be very thankful for that. And be humbled by that, by the way. But also, we can have moms and dads that weren't so godly, or moms and dads that aren't godly at all. Or maybe our moms and dads claim to be godly, but they're not acting it out. You know what, guys and gals, we do not have to follow in the ways of our moms and dads. We need to follow in the ways of the Lord as we see through his word. And, and, you know, just to come and say, hey, you know, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father did. Hey, you could have the worst mom and dad in the world, but by the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, we are redeemed, we are transformed by the power of the Spirit of God. Radically able to change. We don't have to follow that same way. Oh, my mom or dad was an alcoholic, so I'm going to be a mom and dad were very angry all the time. I'm going to be angry all the time. Mom and dad, no, we, we, man, those chains are, we're singing about it tonight, man. My, my, my chains are gone. I've been set free. That includes from those things of your mom and dad. Hey, they might affect you, but you can be free in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 10. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Now, if you remember, the first time Judah re rebelled against Babylon, and for a time, it seems like Nebuchadnezzar actually kind of let them be, but no longer. Now he's come, and he's besieged the city. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were be besieging it. And Jehoiachin, king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made as the Lord had foretold. How sad to read this verse 13. You know, verse 12, they're being carried off, but, you know, now we also read all the treasures. And, and remember when you go into Daniel and we read, you know, about how Nebuchadnezzar's grandson was, you know, hey, let's get all that stuff that we got out of, you know, my grandpappy got out of the Jerusalem and in, 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 the, in the temple, and let's, let's party with that stuff. This is where, when it was taken. And so we see, but notice it says at the end of verse 13, as the Lord had foretold. Well, when did he foretell it? Turn with me back to 1 Kings, please. 1 Kings chapter 9. Starting in verse 6. First Kings chapter 9, verse 6. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them. And the house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Again, we're seeing this happening right here in Second Kings. 
um, in Israel will become a proverb. And notice, a byword among all peoples. You might want to highlight that because I still use this as a, as, as a witnessing tool. It actually says it many times throughout the Old Testament. I was talking to somebody on Sunday about they have a friend that's anti-Semitic, that hates Jews. And, I, and I, I pointed, you know, you know what, that's a fulfillment of prophecy right there. Because it's not logical. Out of all the nations of the world, why are the Jewish people so hated? Because we see even here that they're going to be a byword amongst all peoples as part of the curse of the Lord. Verse 8. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Again, the house that we're talking, we're, we're seeing become a heap of ruins in 2 Kings. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and hissed. They will say, why has the Lord done this to the, this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. You know, it's funny, we were talking about on Sunday in about the United States, how it, it, it was born basically out of Christians wanting to come and, and get away from persecution. And, and that was, it was a born into, it was a, a Judeo-Christian country based upon Judeo-Christian values. And, and how can we not read things like this and not almost hear the echoes, you know, even with our own country, they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and they, they laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. We see this very thing happening all around us today. It's been happening for, for many, many years. Going back even you know, to the world, you know, First World War, Second World War. I think Hollywood, I think you know, entertainment industry has really pushed it on. And, and, it, and it goes on to say, therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. And I truly believe it's only by the grace of God right now that the United States hasn't faced major, major disaster, and it won't shock me when, you know, that, it, you know, even if it comes even while we're still here before the rapture. Look at verse 14. He carried all the way to Jerusalem, and all the officials and the mighty men of valor, valor 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. <coughs> and he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, the mothers, or the, excuse me, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the chief men of the land, he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000 of all of them, strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Matanaha, or excuse me, Matania, a Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. So now once again, you know, the besiegement is over. They've left, they've, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has, you know, replaced now um, Jehoiachin and, uh, with a fellow, you know, his uncle that he renamed to Zedekiah. And here we see again another prophecy fulfilled, yet this time by the prophet Jeremiah. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. It's Jeremiah twenty-two thirty. It says, Thus says the Lord, Write this man down as a childless man who will not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. And we see this happening right before our eyes. All of a sudden, none of his kids, now it's his uncle that, that is going to be there for, for a time. Verse 17 or 18, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Judah, or excuse me, he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamudal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he cast them out from his presence. <clears throat> and Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So again, we've seen once where the king, where Babylon came and they just basically gave up and then they rebelled uh, three years later. Then, it, then Babylon came and besieged them and, and he put the, his own guys in again and they followed him. And now we see that they rebelled in verse 20, verse 20 again. They rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now notice this. 
The same people that rebelled against God are now rebelling against the main ruler at this time in the world. I, that's not a great place to be. As we come into chapter 25, it continues. And in the ninth year of his reign, verse 1, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around. Now again, picture this. How would you feel, by the way, this is the third time if you're Nebuchadnezzar. And you could almost say the first two times, you can almost see a lot of grace and favor being given. It's like, well, the first time we'll just put, you know, we'll take some people out and we'll do this and that and we'll let you, you know, keep going. We'll just keep paying tribute. Then they rebel against that and then they had to come and besiege. And okay, they took a lot of people out this time, took 10,000 and did all this stuff. And okay, we're going to put our own guy in now this time. We're going to put, you know, somebody who's still kind of associated. And now he's now rebelling against it. And we come at the end of verse 1, and, and they built siege works all around it. So here they are, the third invasion of Judah. And again, how angry would you be if you were King Nebuchadnezzar? I'd be pretty upset if myself. And yet they just rebelled against him. And now these siege works, as they're building these different things, if you've ever seen, you know, Lord of the Rings or stuff like that, you can get an idea of some of the old movies that we see about the siege works that they were building. And so, verse 2, it says, So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. At what point do you think you would finally cry out to the Lord? At what point? At what point do you think you would finally cry out? I mean, think about it. They're besieged. And now we're also told there's a famine in the land. It's not just the besiegement which would cut off you know, water and food going in, but there's, now there's also a famine on the land, and the people are starving because of both of these things. And yet they still, we don't still read it. They don't cry out to the Lord. You know, so many people, and you've maybe said this yourself, well, maybe if they hit rock bottom... You know, they'll finally, you know, cry out to the Lord. And I'll be telling you what, I've seen some beautiful things happen with that. It's a sad thing to witness, but it's also blessed to behold at the end. If somebody comes to the end of the line, they might be living on the streets. I remember one guy I knew, he'd lost his wife, he'd lost his kids. He, I mean, just like their, their trust, and she, he was, she divorced him and left him. He lost his business, a multi-million dollar business, all because of drugs. He got hooked on drugs and, you know, I think it was mainly just cocaine, but he, 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 he lost everything. And at the end of it, he came to Christ. He found forgiveness. He found new life. He didn't get his family back. He didn't get his wife back. He didn't get his riches back, but he was at peace with God. And it was beautiful. He had to literally hit rock bottom. But you know what, what tears your heart apart, though, is when you see someone else, when you see them hit rock bottom and they still never turn to the Lord. <clears throat> there's, the, there's that bitterness or there's that pride and they won't come and humble themselves with a penitent heart before God seeking forgiveness of their sins and new life in Jesus Christ. And again, that's what you see. You see this hardness of heart w with Israel. I mean, I would have, oh man, I just would have been crying out. At least I hope and pray I would have been. It's almost like today, though, remember what Jesus said, because lawlessness will increase in the last days. What does this say? The love of many, what? Will wax cold, will grow cold. Man, and we need to be so careful of that, beloved, in Christ, with all the lawlessness we see, with all the things going on, even sometimes when we're getting hurt or when we've been sinned against, man, you know what? May, may God's love, may His Holy Spirit always make, the, may the oil of His Spirit always make our hearts tender with love. May we always remember from whence we've come and from where we're going and have hearts that are humble before God, hearts that are sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit, ready to cry out to the Lord at any time. Because they sure weren't doing that here. Look at verse 4. Then a breach was made in the city. So they broke into the city and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls and the king's garden through the Chaldeans. Uh, excuse me, though the Chaldeans were around the city, and they went in the direction of, um, Ar excuse me, Arabah. 
But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. Notice the king was in with those mighty men, if you will. And overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to king, the king of Babylon, or excuse me, of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. Imagine the last thing you see living is your children being slaughtered before you. And then you're blinded and they don't let you die. It's just amazing. And again, especially in this culture, you're utterly helpless if you're blind. But you know what's interesting? You just, you know, not to hyper spiritualize, but isn't this what sin does to us? It blinds us. Sins blinds men and women and, and, and it enslaves them. What a, what a beautiful picture, what a, what a disturbingly beautiful picture of what sin does. It, it blinds us, it, 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 it enslaves us, it blinds us to what is good and pure and what is holy. And so there it goes. You know, Zedekiah into captivity, blinded. Verse 8, in the fifth month on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzardan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and he burned, verse 9, the house of the Lord. And the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon together with the rest of the multitude. Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. No longer could Israel, or Jerusalem, excuse me, Judah, rebel against them. They had, their city now is on fire, their walls are cast down. They could no longer go and hide behind them, for now they're all cast down, and, and just totally and completely the prophecies of the Lord have been fulfilled now, as Jerusalem is now taken into captivity and again you know as you read through this you know they you know they they found it it's interesting if we read earlier they kind of found a way in they made a breakthrough and then it went in and it just kind of came in and it destroyed everything and and again not to over you know spiritualize but again this is what sin does to our lives when we allow one sin or you know, certain sins to remain in our lives, even as Christian, they still gnaw at us, they still grow. You know, and, and we need to remember that everyone who practices sin you know, and, or commits sin in a practicing manner, those who have not repented from their sins and come to new life in Christ, they're slaves to sin. You, you look around you and you look in the world today, you know, and sometimes some, maybe some looking in the mirror and, and we haven't fully repented. We haven't been born again. Jesus said in John 8, 34, he said this, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin, and that's a con sin, committing sin, a continual matter, is a slave to sin. And we need to remember this. And sin, by the way, never builds up. It only tears down and destroys Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, the thief does not come to accept, to steal and to kill and to destroy. He goes on to say, I have come that they may have life and that more abundantly. You see, again, the things of the world, the sin, the darkness of the world only tear down. They don't build up. They don't bring peace. They don't bring contentment. And we need to, to learn this lesson but in Christ, he brings life and that more abundantly. I look at verse 13. I, this always is, these portions of scripture always grieve me so much. Verse 13, in the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord, and the stands in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, and the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense. 
and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service, the fire pans and also the bowls. What was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver, as silver. Verse 16, as the two pillars, one of the sea and, and the stands that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze and all these vessels was beyond weight. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and on it was a capital of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits. A lattice work in pomegranates, all of bronze, and it were all around the capital. And the second pillar had the same with the lattice work. And remember, this is all things that the Lord had done through, you know, David as he accrued many of the things, and Solomon as he built, now all being torn down, all because of sin, with the rejection of God and his word by his chosen people. Verse 18. And the captain of the guard took Sarai, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war, and five men of the king's council who were found in the city, and the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the city. And Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the hand of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. Again, these are just so sad. Such sad words. Verse 22. And over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed um, <coughs> Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, son of Shaphan, governor. Now when, he had, when he, excuse me, now when all the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, king governor, they came with their men to Gedaliah at Mizpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and Jonathan, the son of Korea, and Shariah, the son of Tanhamath, the Nephophatite, and Jehazaniah, the son of Mahakathite. Boy, those are some words right there for you. Verse 24. And Gedaliah swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid because of the Chaldean officials. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon and it shall be well with you. So he's encouraging them, hey, you know, let's live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it will be well with you. But notice in verse 25, but on the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, the, of the royal family, came with ten men and struck down Gedaliah and put him to death with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Of course they'd be afraid of the Chaldeans. They just wiped out the, the, the people that Nebuchadnezzar had put in charge, and the captain of Nebuchadnezzar, and so they killed this man with, again, there's no point to it, and then just run away. You ever think, why didn't they just run away without killing him? I mean, it's, seriously, it's, a bunch, it's just sad. Verse 27. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the 12th, or excuse me, 27th day of the month, Evel Mordach, excuse me, Merodach, king of Babylon, in the, eighth, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him, in Babylon, and so we see now that you know the new king that is take over, taken over. And, and, and by the way, evil uh, Muradarak doesn't mean that he was evil; that was just his name. And uh, but he, we see it's interesting there at the end of verse twenty-seven that he was gracious. He graciously fled or freed Jehoiachin, even though he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We still see, even as we come to the end of this book, we still see God's grace. We still see God's grace. 
Notice again in verse 28, and he spoke kindly to him, and he gave him a seat above all the kings who were with him in Babylon. So, you know, apparently they had taken all the kings that, when they conquered a land and brought them to Babylon. Verse 29, so Jehoiachin put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. And he was taken care of, as we see once again by the grace of God, even as the Lord, I believe, put it on this man's heart to, to honor and to give, I believe, Israel hope, you know, to kind of show that God, hey, even in the midst of, of the enemies, God can still show favor. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. And even as we come and finish this wonderful book, we ask that you would help each one of us here once again to learn from the words that we've seen, the uh, things that we've read, the actions that people take, the loves or different things. Father, may we learn. Lord, we ask tonight for mercy on our country, Lord. We are sinners, Lord God, even your church. Lord, we are sinners, Lord. Yet we cry out to you for your grace and your mercy in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we ask that you would be glorified, Lord. Lift it up, Father. Lord, just lastly tonight, I'd like to lift up to you Pastor Barry Stagner and, and down at Calvary Tustin. He's been in the hospital the last few days, Father. And, with an unknown infection, Lord, we lift him up to you. We pray that you would touch and heal him, Lord. We pray that you'd help the doctors and nurses, if you choose to work through them, to, to figure out what's going on, Lord Jesus, and, and use this for your glory there, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together.